Patrick is going to be uh, presenting on Thor, but um, before we get into it, uh, is anybody looking for a job or is anybody looking to hire anybody? Yeah. All right. Um, um, uh, there's food, please feel free. Um, awesome cupcakes that uh, Sean's wife makes seemingly every time we have one, so come back. <laughs> um, um, we usually head out to a bar um, just like two blocks down afterward. What, what was it last time? I don't remember. <coughs> we, we tried Liberty Tavern, but it gets a little crowded. Northside Social. Northside Social. North Social. Um, so it's just uh, right down there. Um, uh, anyway, <clears throat> we meet every every two weeks. We're always looking for presenters. I threw uh, lightning talks up on the calendar for August, I think. So if anybody wants to put something together, you're more than welcome to. Uh, with that, Patrick Peake from Browser Media. Okay. And uh, thanks for coming out to see this tonight. Um, the title of the talk is Bringing the Thunder with Thor and Rails Generator to the Command Line. Uh, Jim is very creative with his title name when suggesting this sucks. So um, I will I will use my, the floor. Actually, I my company Browser Media is hiring Rails developers. So if you're looking for a position, we're probably going to hire one or two folks for a couple of client projects that we're kicking off. We're a web agency, so we do a lot of different varied client stuff. So uh, bringing the thunder, boom. So. Of course, there, this is what we're really going to talk about tonight is whether this particular movie will be going to the Oscars this year. So hopefully by the end of the talk, we'll have the answer to this question. Um, in all seriousness, what we're going to cover are kind of three aspects of Thor and how it kind of drifts through the Rails ecosystem. Um, there's Thor, which is the underlying sort of Ruby framework for command line stuff. There's uh, in, Ra in Rails 3, um, generators now run on top of Thor, so knowing kind of how both fit together is, is pretty useful. Uh, and then there's another concept, application templates, which is just a slightly different take, but all pretty similar. So a, a lot of this is, um, is kind of founded on the original Rails vision of like generating code, right? Like you don't want to have to write all this stuff from scratch. Every project has a lot of really common stuff that you just need to, to make happen. Um, and so in Rails 3, Thor, um, is the underlying framework that, that drives generators. Uh, and so if you go to the Ruby Gems uh, page, you see this, which um, I think Yehuda, uh, who is who's building this, kind of intended this to be kind of a replacement for Rake as just a sort of general scripting framework type thing, because he didn't necessarily like how other stuff was done. Uh, in practice, I don't know that anyone is really using this as a replacement for Rake. Has anybody done that kind of anywhere? We're using it on a project, but uh, it's but we still also use Rake for okay. Yeah, you know. yeah. So I, I think I think its niche has kind of been found in just like command line type tools, and um, obviously it's generators. It's it's really nice for generators. Um, but you know I don't necessarily care that its original vision didn't work um, because I think Rake is completely fine. Um, what I do really like it for is command line parsing and um, just as a foundation for the very sort of file and directory manipulation stuff that you want to do in generators. So why would you use Thor? Um, well, the, the first one is that you need a command line options parser. Now, certainly there are many other choices besides Thor that uh, you could pick for this. There's the built-in, um, I don't remember what it's called, and the, the core Ruby library that does it, and there's a couple other frameworks on top of that. Um, so if that's all you care about, you know, Thor might not be hugely compelling. Um, the nice thing, though, is if you're using Rails 3, this is already installed. So if you want to build a gem that does a command line tool, if it's at all going to interact with Rails, it's very likely that, that folks will have this installed already, so it's not yet another dependency that you have to put onto their system. Um, it has a ton of sort of useful file and uh, directory manipulation tasks um, that really make you know, actually doing scripting type stuff pretty nicely if you're interacting with a project. Uh, and finally, if you're going to create a Rails 3 generator, you're, you're probably going to use this uh, in practice. So I'll kind of talk about the, um, the, the three sort of flavors of code generation you tend to see on projects. Uh, and these kind of match the three Thor, um, three things we looked at before with uh, Thor uh, application templates and um, command line apps. So this is the sort of very typical um, you know, code generator, a uh, Rails generator that you'll see. So this is just in Rails 3, the Rails generate model, you give it a, a product name and then a, a series of arguments and it, it creates a product model um, and spits that out. Uh, with an application template, this is actually used when you're creating a new Rails project and you want to do a bunch of configuration immediately after you create it. Maybe you want to install some gems, maybe you want to run some scripts on it. 
um, you can just create an application template called you know stock underscore project and then pass it in as a command line argument to your, your Rails command when you're creating a new project. Uh, and then finally, as a command line, um, you know, pet store upgrade, this is the, the command here, and then I'm running an upgrade command, which is going to do some code generation on top of uh, my project. So a couple key resources, whenever I start sitting down to write generators, there's kind of a couple different pieces you need to pull together to understand how they work. Um, a really good source of information if you're just trying to wrap your head around this is this um, the, the new generators guide. Um, Rails 2 kind of lacked this, and it was, it was kind of hard to figure out really where to start. Um, but this, this guide is actually really helpful in saying, okay, if I need to go in and write a Rails generator, sit down and do it, it kind of walks you through it. Um, and then the other two things you need kind of access to just to know, okay, what type of commands do I have? What can I do? How do I create files? How do I, um, you know, do templates is there's the Thor, the sort of core Thor actions, and we'll look at these a little bit later. These are the sort of low level functions like create file, delete file, um, build templates. And then there's the Rails generator classes, which add on top of it sort of the Rails specific stuff like running Capistrano and things like that. So I just keep, I kind of put these together actually as a handy reference myself, so when I need to go look things up, I can just go right to those documents. So this is probably highly familiar to most folks, but I kind of wanted to start as an orientation. Who has not worked sort of heavily with Rails and is not familiar with generators? Anybody? Okay. So I'll, I'll cover the basics of this just to, to keep everyone on, on, on track here. So in Rails in Rails 3, you say Rails generate, you, you give it the name of the generator you want to run, and then the rest of this is just all command lines uh, arguments that get passed to it. So in this case, we're just creating uh, a model called turtle with an, a single attribute called string. You know, it, by default, it's going to invoke an active record generator, which is going to generate a migration and a class, and then create some tests and some script or some uh, uh, fixture data around that. So, what's more interesting is when you want to roll your own generator, um, which can be very helpful anytime you need to, uh, either if you have a library that needs to add a bunch of things to other projects and you want to just automate that, uh, or if you have a project that you want to stamp out a whole bunch of similar, similar things. And Rails 3 has added a pretty nice feature. Uh, which is you know lovely meta. It's a generator generator. So you can just give it the name of the generator you want, and what you'll get is just these these three these two directories. Um, a product. Direct, this is the name of the generator here. Product. It creates the product generator. It creates a usage file, which is just a help sort of a default help file, uh, and then it creates a directory called templates, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So this is what you get in your Rails project when you run this. Good question. Yep. When you do Rails new, is that a generator or not? Uh, Rails, the actual Rails command is itself a Thor command. And so we'll kind of look at what Rails new versus like Rails uh, generate means. But it's actually using Thor underneath the covers and do some stuff. So to be able to say Rails instead of Thor, mm -hmm. is that like, do you like, does Thor have that feature where like you install it and then it changes its name or you have to make your own file to? We'll actually, I'll actually look at that a little bit later. But yeah, you, you can wrap, you can build command line tools where you never have to invoke Thor. You just expose, this is the API I want for my for developers to use. I just want to run the name of the script and it'll, it'll take care of it. So uh, this is just a, a sort of a filled out version of the product generator that we just did. Um, and there's kind of a, a couple important notes about this and I'll kind of walk through it line by line. One of them is that as you, when you build a generator in Rails 3, all you're really doing is defining a series of public methods. And what's going to happen is when this generator runs, it's just going to execute every public method in the order that it gets invoked. So in this case, the create product method will get invoked. It's going to create a single file. And then after that, that happens, it's going to uh, create a test file. Um, so what you see here with create, create product is we're creating a single file in our, in our apps models directory. Um, the default generator generator uh, creates it using the superclass called named base, and that's the, you see a very common pattern with all the Rails generator where they all kind of take a single argument and then just a, a series of commands, and so that's just a kind of a nice convention uh, that provides a, a couple defaults. And so you basically have to give it a, a name. So you say Rails generate product. That that is exposed in a couple of places. So like you have file name, which is just the, the camel case version of whatever you passed in as a, as a name, and then you've got an automatically access to a plural name uh, as well as the, the class name. So because I pass in like product, it will it will automatically handle that. 
And so this, when we say create file, you're passing it two, two arguments, and this is pretty consistent for most of the, uh, the Thor commands. The first argument you're passing is what is the actual name of the file that I want to create? And then the second argument is either a block of some sort or a string. In this case, we're just doing the eval string. It's going to say it's going to create a file which has class productized name. This is just a method call. Anything that's private down here is going to be accessible in your template. So if you have a fancy calculation method that you need to do a bunch of like string manipulation or whatever to build something, you can just create a little handy method down here. And then rather than cluttering up your template with all sort of long, complicated um, ERB evaluations, you can just say, okay, well, I want my productized name to be whatever the class name is, capitalized, and then tack you know, the word product onto the end of that. So this just creates a single class, gives it a name, and then gives it a single attribute um, writer. And then the second one, which we'll talk a little bit about now, is this template command. So th this is just creating a single file, and it's going to evaluate this immediately. This is actually going to use an external template file. So we're passing it, in this case, the source template file that we want to use. In this case, I have a file in my project called unit test underscore rb dot erb, and I'll talk about why that in a second. And then the file I actually want to create in the in the project that I'm running that in is just test unit models, and then the name of my file. So any any questions about this so far before I move forward? Um, oh, and before I go to one other thing to take note of, this is the default um, for all sort of generators within Rails. It's the idea of the source root. What the source root means is where where does uh, Thor look when it needs to find template files, right? So this is a relative path. This is the actual directory it's going to look in. And this, for for most Rails generators, you don't need to worry about this. It's just you just stick stuff in the template directory. But if you're doing um, Thor applications, you can actually tinker with, with where that goes um, to to find uh, templates in a different location. Uh, and the working directory, like where this where you invoke this, where it actually like writes the files out, is going to be with generators, the root directory of the application. So when I say, even if I'm sort of two directories deep in the Rails project, and I say, you know, script generate, or uh, Rails generate this uh, product, it's going to stick it in the sort of root app models. Uh, and that's important to know, too, because you can actually change that working directory uh, for other reasons. So this is an example of that uh, unit test template file that we just used. And you can see that this is kind of an ERB file, essentially. It's really no different. You've got the ERD evaluations. You have access to all the private methods that are on the generator itself to output those. So if I wanted to use the uh, productized name <coughs> method, I could just call that right there. Um, and I name this, you don't really have to name these files anything in particular. Some people name them uh, Ruby files. I name them just with the ERB extension because when I'm editing, that way the code editing highlighter will say, okay, it thinks this is an ERB file, which it actually is, and it will sort of highlight things correctly. Otherwise, it, gets, it can get a little confused by the sort of class ERB stuff because you can have templates that are, you might be writing out an HTML file, you might be writing out a, um, you know, a Ruby file. So uh, I just want to kind of, we, we touched on these key points, but I wanted to kind of put them up here to remember. Um, so key points with all Rails generators and Rails 3 is uh, all public methods are invoked in sort of top-down order of declaration. Private methods are available in the templates. You can have inline or external templates. Uh, and the working directory is always the root of the project. So when you create your own generator, you every method that you create that's public will be called? Yes. Okay. So and that's really, this is just an organization technique. You could easily just have, you can call these methods whatever you care to. If they're public, they're going to get called. You could have one giant method, or you could break it down into smaller methods. It's just, it's totally up to you on how it works. Okay, so this might be a little bit hard to read um, now that I'm looking at it up here, but this is basically uh, the documentation page for Thor Actions, which is the, the page that I, I pulled up before. So it just defines a series of sort of useful functions. There's one for creating files. You can create links. You can go fetch uh, HTML or whatever from the web and pull it down into a project. Um, you can go inside a subdirectory if you wanted to run a command inside the app like the app directory of your project, you could just say inside, give it a block, and then run the command, and that will change the relative working directory. So you don't have to have like really deeply nested, nested paths all over the place. Um, so this documentation is pretty pretty useful when you're actually sitting down and say, okay, well, I need to do this. How do I create a file? How do I append an existing file? How do I stick something at the beginning of a file? Um, you can just go to the, the Thor actions 
Um, and so none of these are Rails specific at all because this is all just uh, built into Thor. And any generator that you have that you build in Rails is going to have access to these. Uh, and then so layered on top of that is the Rails uh, generator actions. And these are again, just a, this is just a snapshot from the actual uh, API documentation. But you can see it adds things like invoke a rake task. Um, I can't remember if this is actually invoke a rake task or, or create a rake task. Um, invoke a git, um, you know, git init or add. Uh, you know, run Capify on your project. So stuff that's very specific to Rails projects. Uh, and again, all generators have access to these automatically. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show kind of a silly generator trick I put together for the, the latest version of Browser CMS. So the idea with uh, Browser CMS, this the open source project I work on, is we've got these external gems that we want to like install into a project, and I want to make sure that that's dead simple. So I built a generator, uh, an install generator. And so when this gets invoked, you pass it in the name of the module, and it just says, okay, well, go ahead and add this, that, that gem to the gem file, then run a generator here. So if I say, if I have like my news module, I can just say, you know, in, you know CMS install news, adds that to the gem file, runs, runs a generator, which is now part of the project, and then adds a root um, to the roots file. So this is just some nice little automation you can add to projects if you want to just manipulate stuff and install things. Um, so moving forward to kind of your question with Rails command line applications, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can generate code. You don't necessarily need a Rails generator to do it because the actual syntax in, in all these cases is, is now kind of the same. So when you're doing this, you know, Rails new my app, you're really doing code generation. And under the cover, there's, there's uh, Thor at work. The really nice thing about this, and the reason I, I do it on occasion, is because in a lot of cases you actually want to package this um, this command line tool as a gem. You don't necessarily want to have to include it in a project, you just want to be able to run it. Um, and with a generator, you can certainly do that. You can, you can build a gem, <coughs> add a generator to it, add it into your project, but then that generator is going to be in the list of all the generators that are there. Every time someone says, okay, well, what do I invoke? It's cluttered up with stuff that you really mainly run once in the life cycle of a project. And so a good example of this um, was uh, we were upgrading uh, Browser CMS from Rails 2 to Rails 3. So it's possible for someone to have an existing Rails 2 project. I want to do both. I want to come, I want to come along, run one script, and upgrade that project to Rails 3, you know, deleting all the old uh, Rails 2 code, and also adding in the new stuff. And there's a kind of a dependency problem there, because I can't just add the Rails 3 stuff to the project to have access to a generator because all the, the gem file and bundler, those all changed. So the solution that I did with this was just a, a Thor command line app that you can just come along and run that's going to overwrite all the files as needed. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of making a gem uh, which is going to contain a command line tool that uses Thor. So with, with bundler, there's a pretty, pretty easy way to just build a new gem. There's commands you can run, bundle, bundle gem. In this case, I want to create a gem called pet store. It's going to generate a bunch of files. Um, this shows what gets generated, creates a, a Git repo, and then just a little uh, overview of the directory structure that gets built. Um, and I also pulled some some of these examples a little bit. I was inspired by the uh, the Rails Rails casts, and that's just a URL down there for how you can actually create a new gem with Bundler if you're interested interested in that. Uh, and so this is just kind of a two two things I generated as the process of that. Um, there was a, an article a little while ago about sort of how do you when you when you're building gems for distribution like how should you like what do you put in your gem file versus, versus what do you put in your gem spec and so this is just kind of enforcing sort of best practice ideas on how this should work. Basically, your gem file is kind of nothing more than hey, we'll go look at that gem spec and then whatever dependencies are there, that's what makes that's what you you should use. So in this case, we we'll just say gem spec. Again, this is all generated as part of that. The interesting thing that you'll see down here is that it's actually specifying the executables that are part of this project. I'm, in, I'm not, I, this is the first time I actually looked at this file, so you can specify specifically what the name of your executable it is. This looks like it's just using git to uh, say, okay, find every file that's in the uh, executable directory and make that part of it. So that seems, a little, that seems a little black magic to me, but presumably it works when you actually package up the gem. So this is kind of a, a little simple Hello World uh, Thor app that, that you can package up. 
so what I did was in the, the bin directory of my project that I just created with, with gem, uh, bundle gem, I created uh, the bin directory and then I created just a, a pet store file. So not pet store RB, just pet store. Uh, and then I, I added the following to it. And again, not all this is actually used, but the two things I'm including here are the Thor actions and then the Rails generator actions because I'm going to use these in some of the examples coming up later. Um, but with, with Thor, when you create an actual Thor application, really all you have to do is just create a class, extend from Thor, and then at the bottom of it, you just have to say, okay, class.start, and then that makes all of those uh, functions that you've defined available. So what you see here is one, sort of one function, it's called hello, where we have to provide a description for that particular method so that when we run, and so when the user runs the command line app down here, bet, in the pet, forward slash pet store, it knows how to actually generate uh, help text automatically. And so in this case, the, the command line app just is doing the very simple, uh, straightforward hello world. So questions about this? When you said, so what does calling start do again? That's just, that's just Thor's convention for like, go ahead and kind of define all the stuff you want to invoke and then you just have to say start and then it will parse the command line arguments and take care of all of that. So, I don't know. I don't actually know what it does because I haven't looked at the code, but you just have to define the class and then you say start, it, it handles parsing all that stuff. The nice thing about this is you can actually move this class you know, off to another file and just include it and require it, and then you don't have to keep you know, code in this particular binary file. Any other questions? Um, and one thing I did run into when I was developing the, um, the example here is you may have to just change the permissions on the actual pet store file so you can run it just with a chmod. And so here's a more sort of detailed version of this where I'm actually doing some uh, more serious work. Uh, and this is similar in some, in some sense to the, the sort of new project uh, command line app for browser CMS. So basically what I'm doing is I want to create a Rails application and then go into that app and like break a bunch of stuff or add some stuff, whatever. So the first thing I do is I find a method called new. It takes a parameter name, which again is just going to be the command line arguments that get passed in. I then just call Rails new and then I pass it whatever got passed in. And then I set the working directory. This is the, in this case the destination root. Because as soon as I do that, what I want to do is go into that project directory and then add some gem files and then I want to gener run generator. So I need to make sure my working directory is actually inside that Rails app. Uh, and then I'm just showing off some of the other random commands here, how to add stuff to the environment file. So questions, questions about this? So these, uh, like generate and environment, those come from Rails generators actions? Uh, yeah, a mixture of this. This is probably, I think this might be um, Rails generator. This is also Rails, and I th actually I think all these are from Rails. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if Gem is a, a Rails or a, or a um, or a Thor action. But you can, again, because we've added, we've included all the actions, we can invoke any of them that we want in the in this method. Um, the key distinction here um, that I should point out, though, is unlike a Rails generator not everything in here gets invoked, right? Not every public method is going to be automatically invoked. It's only going to invoke the actual method name that you're calling. So in this case, we want to call knit new, and that's, that's what's going to get called. Yes? And so I can I can read the, the, the run command you've got there, mm -hmm. and kind of put all together. Uh, new there, that first argument, that's your method, and the piece after is the single parameter getting passed in? This, um, this, is, real, this is actually a, um, uh, Thor, basic sort of one of the basic scripts. Basically, it just says run whatever command you pass me. And so this is just a very simple, silly way to like run a Rails command on on an, ex an existing directory. So this could be, you know, it could be rake. It could be if you have some random command you want to run, that'll run that too. And the nice thing about it is it handles some of the platform inconsistencies between Windows and and uh, Unix systems. So you don't necessarily have to deal with, I, and again, I don't know how far it goes because path names make it a little silly. I don't know if it actually converts forward slashes to backward slashes, that kind of thing. But it would be a little safer than kind of writing it on your own. And if I have new accept more than one argument, mm -hmm. does, does that still work? I can pass uh, multiple? Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure. The way, you typically end up specifying that with method options, which I'll show you uh, in, in a minute. So, and 
speaking as, as we were. So this is a, a more complex command that we've added to this the same uh, pet store app. So basically this is an updates uh, script. So if I want to have a command line app that I can just go into an existing project and run the update command, but I want to pass it some parameters in here. This syntax here just shows how does, how does Thor take command line arguments and then parse them out a little bit. So we've, we've specified one option called break it. Uh, it's the alias is dash B. We're going to enforce that it's a, a Boolean and then we're going to default it to false. And so that within the method itself, we just check to see, okay, did options break it get passed in? If it did, we just go ahead and remove the, uh, the Rails script file. So because obviously when we're writing upgrade scripts, all we want to do is break uh, our projects. So questions about this? There's a whole series. There's a lot more. If you, if you look at the uh, Thor wiki, it has a lot of information on the other method. Um, method options that you can pass in there too. Yes. Does the ordering matter? Like you have to do the description first, then method option? Uh, I No, I don't think so. You just have to have them connected. It's doing a little bit of, of trickery because it's basically, you normally define them before the method. I'm not sure what would happen if you did it after. Because you need to match this to this, it may be fine to do it after. I haven't really played around with it. By convention, you kind of put it up above it though as sort of documentation for this is what my method is going to do. So. And so this just shows an example of how you actually run the command. Um, the first thing I'm doing here is because all of the methods get some auto-generated auto help based on their syntax, I can actually run, um, you know, here's the name of the command line argument I'm running, help, and then I want help on the update method, and it'll tell me how it should be used as well as the specific options that I can pass in uh, with the description that we gave it. Uh, and this is very similar to how the Rails uh, generator's usage file gets used to just sort of spit out Hey, if I want auto discovery, how is this thing going to work? You, you, you put it in the usage file. When you're writing a Thor app, it kind of just you put it all in the code that we saw. So in this case, I've run the command twice, the update command with, with no option, does nothing, and then I run it again and it, uh, with the dash B option, and it just, you can see that it's removing the, the script Rails file from the project. And uh, the, if you see the syntax highlighting, a lot of the Rails 3 stuff is starting to take advantage of that. You can use that in your own project, actually, by um, throwing, what it? this, this uh, term, ANSI color. You can just make arbitrary string red if you need to as part of your command line output, which is kind of useful. And again, I think Rails depends on that as well. So it's something that you'll probably have for most projects that you're working on too, as long as Rails 3 is installed. Okay, so any questions about uh, Thor command line apps? I'm gonna talk about application templates next otherwise. Questions? No? Okay, so the third way that, that Rails and generator syntax will, will sometimes drift into projects is through the concept of application templates. Um, really, these are just you know .rb files that can exist anywhere you need them to. They can be on, on your local system, or they can be uh, on a remote server. And when you're so when you're creating a new Rails project, you very often want to configure it in some way. There's probably if you work at a, a company, you may have your set of core modules or core gems that you're always installing for projects. And so an application template is a pretty nice way to sort of codify that knowledge into something that you can just pass into the new project, so you don't have to to do a lot of manual configuration. And so this is kind of a sample template. You can see that it's really just a flat, you know, .rb file. There's no class. There's no nothing. Um, but it has the same exact syntax that you'll see um, with the Thor and Rails generator. So we've got, you know, the git command. So what this is essentially doing is creating an initializer file in my Rails project. It's going to take whatever I stick in here and stuff that into the file. It's then going to add a gem, uh, in this case Capybara, uh, for the two particular groups, group uh, development and test. It's going to go ahead and create a Git project and then can do a commit. Uh, and the nice thing about this too is you can actually make them interactive. So as you run your command, you can actually prompt for input and use that to make decisions. So in this case, we can ask the user, would you like to install a device gem? If you do, go ahead, add the gem to my gem file, and then run the device install generator on top of that. Uh, you know, we can run Capistrano on the project, Capify it, and then finally just run bundle install to like get all the gems and things configured. So that's a sample application template. 
And so the nice thing about application templates is because they don't have to be local to your system, you can actually run a web app that will generate application templates for you. Um, and so this is from a, a site called railswizard.org, which I believe in Tradia built. Um, but basically it's a nice fancy web interface where you can click these buttons to say, okay, well I want this for my project, I want this for my project. Uh, in this case, I'm building a template that is going to use Active Record, Devise, Git, and Rails admin. And then when you, once you push finish, you get this right here. Rails new, you know, uh, the name of the project I'm going to generate, and then this, this dash M is how you specify the template. And then it just generates this, um, you know, hashed name of it. And that, that, RB file, that .rb file is up there on the web. I can run this locally. It'll pull that template down and then run it to configure things. So that's, that's all I've got. Questions? Um, I know you are, you were using it for browser CMS. Mm -hmm. um, did you take old like Rails 2 generators and convert them into this and what yeah. was that like? I, had to just, I basically just had to rip them apart. Um, part of the problem with the Rails 2 generators is you could find some documentation on how they work, but they weren't very, they weren't very clean and they were not very easy to follow. So in some cases I was rewriting stuff that was really Rails 2 specific anyway, so it kind of just made sense to start over with you know, what are the commands, what generators do I want to expose to my user, um, and then how do they get invoked. Um, and I'll, I can actually show an example of a generator. I can pull it up here. So this, this is just an example of, of you know, the, one of the core CMS generators that I ended up rewriting because they weren't necessary, but it's, it, this one's pretty straightforward. It's just adding some code to the application directory uh, and then, add, then copying migrations into the project. The more interesting one is probably something like this. Where we've actually got quite a few files that get generated. Just gonna increase the font size on that. Yeah, so what we're just going through and just creating a bunch of files. There's some there's some some stuff you can do, I didn't mention this because it's kind of very specific to projects, but if you're worried about people rerunning your generators over top of stuff and deleting them, you can um, you can add this check for class collision and it'll, it'll check to see if there's a file there already before it just goes ahead and overwrites it. Does so, that uh, prompt? I believe it prompts is what it does. And there's also some built-in stuff within Active Record for dealing with you need to generate migrations with timestamps on them. This this stuff will kind of handle auto generating the, the migrations for that stuff to to uh, apply it. Let me scroll down a little bit so you can see how that gets used. So here, I just say migration template and pass it in the migration the table name. I don't have to worry about the timestamp. So yeah, I just end up scrapping them and rewriting them because there was there was too much that had changed between Rails 2 and Rails 3 anyway. Yeah. You said the uh, the generators will fire off each public method. Yes. Um, now to get that same feature in Thor, it's you, instead of inheriting from Thor, you would inherit from Thor group? Is that yes, right? Thor group is the actual <coughs> underlying behavior that, um, that mimics that. So like I think Rails generators are actually Thor groups which just says, okay, every public method on you, just call you in order. Um, I didn't necessarily want to do that with, a Thor, with the Thor apps that I built. Um, and I'll, I'll show you one particularly nasty looking uh, upgrade script. That I, this is the actual upgrade script I was trying to do to actually check. Um, basically I wrote, this is to upgrade to like a, a browser CMS version two to version three. Um, and so I'm doing a bunch of checking, checking to see if a file exists. And if it does, I'm saying, okay, go ahead and actually you know, do the migration, write the new file out into the project that needs, that needs to be there to fix it. Uh, and then further down, some of the stuff I did is, because there was commonalities between things, I would just end up with, I would end up with methods like this, where like this is the actual method that's getting invoked, but because this is common to two or three methods, I just sort of apply them in order like that. And that's just how I ended up organizing this file. Which again, could be bad, could be good, just how I happen to do it. Have you uh, found 
problems with testing uh, Thor apps mm -hmm. or um, best practices to testing these because of command line apps? Right. Well, I don't believe in testing for one. No. <laughs> um, there is actually a, uh, a Rails. Uh, there is a Rails generator test class that will handle some of this. Yeah. And let me see if I can actually find the test that I wrote for some of the generators. And so this is one of the ones I ended up rewriting to. Um, to test the, the new project generator to make sure that it was really manipulating the Rails project correctly. Um, and so, so this is the generator test case, which I think basically just sticks a temporary directory and then starts invoking things into it. So I just basically generated a shell Rails app, and then I'd assert that after I run the generator that all these files exist there. So it, is generate Rails app a uh, Rails uh, from, does that come from Rails 3 or is that? No, that's, I think that's actually down at the bottom of the method. I'm not really generating like the full app because I'm not, I'm not manipulating the whole app. I'm just manipulating a directory with like one or two files in it. So, and this test is not complete and comprehensive anyway, but I just need to know, okay, I, if I need to start, because I'm deleting a seeds database, a seeds.rb file and adding some other stuff in there, that needs to be there. Otherwise the generator itself will just blow up as part of it. So, okay. but you could, I could presumably just run, I could just add the, the, the run command the Thor run command to like run a Rails generate and just set the directory of where I wanted it to go as part of this as part of the setup. If I was really interested in testing more stuff completely. Okay. Um, j just for for testing, I I played with Aruba, which is a command line um, library for testing with Cucumber. I'm curious about what it, what it would be. I would like be very interested here. to see because again, so the test coverage on this is not is not great in some cases. So I'd be definitely interested to see. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, I only tried it just to kind of kick the tires on it. it. Right. I don't think you'd ever really, I don't know, sit down with a client and say, well, what kind of command line sure. do you want to have? But um, uh, I'd be curious to see what, how, how it would be. Yeah, I would too, actually. Any other questions? Yes. The, now, this is to test a Rails generator. Yes. Is there something like this that comes uh, bundled with Thor itself, so you can test a Thor uh, command line now? There, there in fact might be, but I, I don't know. I, and I don't, that's why in some cases I don't have commands for this um, specifically. Okay. I would, my, my first instinct would be to like take that Thor class and like mock it out in some ways just to test that it's invoking the commands, but if anyone has a better suggestion on how they've tested these things, I'm all ears. So. But yeah, you could probably, I would assume you could probably figure out how that actually works and, and, and stick it in there somewhere. Did I get another question over here? I wanted to reignite it on flame war between Ryan and I. Okay. Where uh, I noticed awesome. some, you, you probably come down on Ryan's side. Um, you were you're writing the proscripts as command line programs, so mm -hmm. you put them in bin, right? right. And uh, you wouldn't use like Thor list, Thor dash T, right? Uh, the auto discovery of Thor tasks under a project well, task. Task. in this case yeah, in right. this case no tests. and that only because I don't my, I don't necessarily want to like the API browser CMS I don't necessarily want to expose Thor as part of that mm -hmm. in the same way that Rails doesn't really care that like Thor is actually what's powering a lot of its generators so that's more of like an API decision and plus we before I even started using these like the first version just had a, a plain old like you know opt parse script when it was really mm -hmm. simple and wasn't doing very much so I don't want to like change that API as part of the, the second version. So we're using Thor in a project, and we use it more more like uh, the way you would have written break tasks in mm -hmm. a project to do certain data munching tasks or something like that. And uh, one of the things I liked was being able to put uh, all of your Thor scripts, I guess, under a tasks directory, mm -hmm. and then they all end in dot Thor, and then you can do Thor dash T, and it lists it out kind of like break dash T would. Right. And I like that. The idea of like you know auto discovery, I think it's like a nice feature for a new developer coming into your app or something like that. They can just, mm -hmm. just like I might blind, blindly do a rig dash t to see if there's anything you know custom in this app. Right. I do a thor dash t and see. Ah, oh, yeah, that's nice. Absolutely. I, I would definitely totally. I think I would definitely do that if I was writing a lot of thor scripts for like a specific project, um, because the boundaries of where this goes is like out onto the webs. I want to make sure that like the API is like I just go to my C. I type you know, I can go and say like. Type uh, 
from the actual script here. Uh, actually, I don't know if I have this installed in RVM, but I can type, you know, pet store, or uh, in this case, dot dot. Dot dot. I can just run this this one command and, and get a list of all the stuff mm -hmm. that's under it. And, and this, this type of discovery, I think, is really good when a user has no idea what your project is, they don't have any concept of what you can do, but be able to go to like the one sort of command to, to rule them all and they have, have a whole bunch of subcommands that are easy to discover, I think is, is valuable when you're putting out an API, for instance. So, but within a project, I can certainly understand it's just faster to just and easily clean, just add new ones in there automatically. Especially if you're splitting it out into multiple files too, I guess. This is all kind of one file with like maybe at most like six or eight commands. So like Rails, because I think Rails does this too when you run it. It has a ton. It just has a ton of options. But it has more options. Actually, I can't um, yeah, Rails, Rails new as the default one. But actually, this is the old version of Rails here. You know. So for creating this kind of output. Um, does Thor do some of the stuff for you where it'll split out the options or, you know, do you have to do any kind of special formatting to get it in the it short? Does, it does all that stuff automatically just by ascribing to the, um, just pull this up here. Just by specifying like what your option methods are, all this just automatically happens because there's basically a data structure about like what the API to your to this method is. Okay. So, and you know, presumably this is you know some measure of workaround by the fact that these are all like you know dynamic dynamic methods. And if you, even if you like stuck a name method on there or a name parameter on there, it couldn't discover that hey, I want that to be a string. Whereas in like something like Java, you can say this is a string, and it can just inspect that to know hey, you have to pass a string in here. But yeah, it's all the actual help stuff gets pretty much generated for you. I guess on, on the topic of the help, um, mm -hmm. I found very early on that Thor will complain if you have a public method that doesn't have a description. Yes, which is a good a good prompt practice. to some extent, because if it's not if it's public, it's supposed to be something that users can invoke. Um, so presumably, I don't know if it it, can, it probably complains, but it's does it still actually run it? Um, when I first played with it, it would it okay. would error out and tell you why. Right, which is good to kind of force programmers to actually document stuff to some extent. I was checking out the method where you do um, define task or where like mm -hmm. a method gets added, and it basically said like if the description and the options haven't been defined, there are the exceptions. So. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's it's doing that check probably when it hits that method. It's like hey, there's a right method. method that, that's when it throws it. Okay. That, that's good to know. So that probably answers the ordering question. Then yes, too. Yeah, the ordering all has to come before. So. Anything else? Okay. I'll go on if you want. Absolutely. Um, what's your, what's your you know, now that you've evaluated both, I mean, you've used both Rake and Thor now. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're always being considerate of the tools we choose, not just sort of ritually going with whatever everybody else happens to be using, right. um, why ever use Rake again for most of the stuff we typically use Rake for? Uh, that's that's a a little bit of a question that I have to kind of answer from my, my perspective and like how my shop runs is like, you know, uh, we've been, as an agency, we've been in business for 13 years now mm -hmm. and we have something like 200 plus like websites that we run for different clients. And so the thing I kind of value to some extent is consistency between mm -hmm. projects. Like it's possible that Thor might be like 5% better than Rake for like efficiency of tasks. But if I, if I do a project with that, someone else coming in from all the other 10 projects that are all also using Rake is going to be like, oh, how does this work? And it's not to say they won't be able to figure it out. It's just I haven't seen the benefit of it there yet to try to replace it. Because to some extent, too, like... Rake is good every time I need to begin accepting arguments in Rake, though. Yeah, yeah. This is me. Fuck, I don't do that. Yeah, I, I don't pull up the browser and go, you know, figure... And it's some goofy, you know, it's always this goofy, you know, abuse of the hash syntax and everything right. to get that to work in and Rake. I, and that, that's why, I, like, I love Thor. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had to do that, I would almost certainly do it. I will find myself actually writing commands, like actual commands, though. I've done this for several internal things uh, for like sharing keys to other servers and stuff like that. I'll just write this as a Thor app because mm -hmm. that way I can say, okay, gem install that gem, and then now that command is just on there as a, as a, a binary I can call. The syntax that I was invoking this here, um, 
here, this is actually, I haven't installed this as a gem yet, I'm just, it's just a relative path, but once you install this, is, if I actually took the pet store gem, made it, published it, pulled it down to my system, I could just say pet store 2 kind of from anywhere on my system because of how Rails um, and the gems will expose those executables to your system. So in that case, if it makes sense, I do that for, for things that are common. Um, but I can certainly see doing it. I think if for, these, if for us, we have just a consistency issue between projects that we're trying That's to carry together. So. I always feel for you, I felt like this may be an imaginary story arc, but in my mind, he went in with Thor to really replace Rake in the way that Rails uses it because mm -hmm. Rake's original vision was a replacement for Make, which yeah. is more like file dependency building kind of stuff. And I think in the Rails, you know, Ruby Rails community, we almost never ever use it that way. Right. Um, you know, Rake DB migrate it's, it has nothing to do with you know, Absolutely. building files or anything like that. So in that way, it's like, it, it's almost, you wish Thor and Rake had popped up on the scene at the same time, then Thor would have probably been the one actual choice. It might have been, but you know, it's also probably to say that like a lot of the failings of, of Rake after having used it for many years was like, okay, these are the pain points that I see because we're trying to use this what was a compiling build tool in other systems mm -hmm. for like basic, you know, code generation or scripting tasks. So, and you know, it might get there. I, again, I don't know that now that you just kind of moved off from the Rails three stuff and is doing some of the, the mobile stuff, whether that will stay. But you know, I think it's 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 easily infected all the generators um, in Rails three and much to the benefit because Rails 2 generators were really messy and like hard to figure out, so. Is there like a reason why you don't tend to need, um, I guess, uh, have complex dependencies and like build tasks in Rails? Well, most or cases. Rails beginner, okay, but yeah. I know like guys, guys in uh, .NET have started looking into Rake for, uh, to automate their builds their build files. So I guess I'm wondering like, why is it not that important? It's worth, it's worth clarifying that uh, in both Thor and Rake, you can have, you can define tasks that depend on other tasks. So you can build up those kind of dependency structures that way. What I was mentioning specifically was like in, you can define, uh, you know, build rules in a make file. Like you can in a Rake file that say, you know, I need this, you know, dot object file to be created and it's gonna depend on this dot C file. So here's the rules to build that dot object file from this dot c file. The dot c file is newer than the object file. All that that kind of stuff. Rake Rake has all that baked in, and I don't think Thor has any concept of, of that kind of stuff. Um, but both of them have inter task dependency uh, oh, management. You were saying that that seems to be less important. Yeah, in in Ruby there's uh, the file dependencies are less important than yeah, the day to day yeah. actions. Yeah, that sort of task. Yeah, the, the dependencies yes. and the dependencies that bite Rails developers are, are usually around gems, which is a lot of what gem file and um, and um, bundler are trying to solve. Which is say, if I've got, you know, I'm using this particular version of blue cloth, which might have a dependency on something that like rake up here is depending on, and so that the the whole like library dependency issue is kind of external to Thor or rake. It's just in Rails three, it's specified mostly with bundler. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys. And girls. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, we have a presentation. If anybody wants to work on Thor, you know, this is a good time to kind of pull out your laptop, try something out, build a small app with it. Patrick can answer questions, or anybody else who has experience with it. So we'll hang out here for a little bit. Uh, then there's food in the back, and we'll also head out to a bar just down the road. Uh, and they're in fact Thor-themed cupcakes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>